virtual reality is not going away anytime soon, which is a good thing because it's super cool. In this video, I'll go over what makes modeling and texturing for VR a bit different than for regular games. Any 3D model can technically be used in a virtual reality environment, but there are a lot of limitations pretty specific to the platform that should be taken into account in order to get the most out of every polygon and pixel. So here's 10 things to keep in mind when creating for VR. First up, build to scale. It's often helpful for artists to use accurate measurements when building game assets in order to maintain consistency. But when working for VR and AR, it becomes even more important. Virtual worlds don't always need to be realistic, but they do need to be believable enough in order for the player to be comfortable with navigating the experience. The most important things to scale and position correctly are things that can be gripped by a hand, such as a door handle, weapon, or steering wheel. The second most important objects to get right are those that people are already familiar with in real life. The proper height and width of cars, stairs, light switches, desks, chairs, windows, doors, ceilings, and all those different things can help make players feel more at home in an otherwise alien universe. Three to three and a half feet, about one meter, is a good height for things that should be grabbed, and five feet, roughly one and a half meters, is a good height for things that should be at eye level. Those are just good rules of thumb based on averages but also keep in mind that kids and people of all different sizes will be playing your game. If you've done that and things are still feeling a bit off even though you're using accurate measurements, try adding a few smaller details like trim or screws and see how big of a difference it makes. This goes for texturing just as much as modeling, so be extra mindful when placing those brick and tile textures. Number two, think like a designer. Most games have a limited amount of ways that players can use objects and use the same command for each one. You don't really have to know what something is or how it works in order to press X to interact. In VR, however, that type of mechanic feels stale and extremely limiting, since players want to explore and use their hands to interact with objects like they would in real life. As a result, 3D modelers need to use visual design techniques to communicate how an object is intended to be used. Even if it's a totally strange tool that comes from an alien universe and does something the player has never seen before, they should still be able to look at it and figure out how to use it without any interjecting tutorials. Visual cues that help people understand what the function of an object is in their environment is called an affordance. Wheels tell you which direction something can move in, knobs look like they are meant to be twisted, handles are built for pulling and picking up, and buttons, bars, and flat areas communicate pushing. Every object that can be interacted with should look and feel fully functional. Since the player can look at things from any angle, an attempt to take a shortcut on this will look pretty sloppy. As an example, I had to modify this revolver concept in order for the handle to fit a hand, and for the trigger to be the right distance from the finger, the cylinder to fit the bullets, the reloading mechanism to pop the cylinder out at the correct angle for reloading, the hammer strike to line up with the bullet and the barrel, and the barrel to be the right size for the bullet, the sights to work realistically, and all that stuff. So most of these changes are relatively minor, but some, like the reloading mechanism, require altering the proportions enough to significantly deviate from the original concept. So there's a huge amount to cover when it comes to affordances and how to design things so that the player feels natural while interacting with them, but that can be a topic for another day. For now, I suggest you read the book The Design of Everyday Things by Don Norman if you're interested in learning more. Number three, prioritize pixels over polygons. Not only do VR games need to run at at least 60 to 90 frames per second in order to prevent motion sickness, everything needs to be rendered twice, once for each eye. There are a few tricks that can speed up the rendering process, but it'll never be as fast as rendering a single viewpoint. As a result, we need to be extremely careful with how much memory our assets will take up. The more optimized our assets are, the more details we can afford to add. The two ways to add detail to any 3D scene are to add more geometry or increase texture resolution. Adding more geometry always looks more realistic, but since we can't model everything down to the atoms, at some point we need to use textures to approximate everything that's going on. Because we need to run everything at that higher frame rate and draw things twice, VR assets need to have a much lower poly count than what you would see in a regular PC game. So even though it's less realistic, we'll need to rely more on textured detail than modeled detail since it can be rendered faster. Reducing poly count is another large topic that we can discuss later, but here are a few tricks that you can use to get yours even lower. First, intersect small details instead of connecting them to the surface. 
The trade-off is that this will waste texture space underneath, so I wouldn't do it for huge details that cover a large area, but for smaller things this can save loads of tries. Second, try to limit the amount of sharp edges or UV seams. This might be a bit out of your control because it depends on the design of the asset in the first place, but do be aware that smooth shading and fewer UV islands is going to be faster. And lastly, any vertex that is not significantly defining the object's silhouette, or is not needed to define a UV seam, can safely be slid to the side and removed. Number four, share as much data as you can. While we can focus on getting details from textures, it's also best not to have too many of them. It's a lot better for a game engine to load one really large texture than many smaller ones. Either make it like that from scratch, or use tools like MeshBaker to combine them for you. What's so cool about the PVR pipeline is that many different objects can all share the same material as well. A metal chair, a leather couch, painted walls, and a wooden table can all share the same textures and the same material, which is excellent for performance. There's an extra draw call per material, so the more objects that share the same material, the less draw calls you will have. Another way to share object data and speed up your game is with instancing. Many objects sharing the same mesh and materials is a great way to add a bit of visual complexity without impacting speeds too much. The trick here is to use modular pieces that can be combined with other objects in a variety of ways. You can also set per instance properties and slightly tweak a few settings for each one so that the effect isn't quite so obvious. Number five, use even texel density. In my courses about modeling and texturing first-person weapons, I mentioned how we can get the most out of our textures by sizing UVs in proportion to their distance from the camera. In VR, however, players can stick the camera just about anywhere by moving their heads, so we need to take a slightly different approach. Instead, try to aim for a fairly even texel density. The only areas to optimize, if you really need to, are places that the player likely won't look, such as the underside of a shelf. Number six, be careful with normal maps. Normal maps are my favorite way to add extra detail to game objects, but in VR, their effectiveness is essentially cut in half. They still work great for fine detail, or for detail that is far away which you can't inspect up close, but those slick beveled edges that we've come to know and love won't quite look as good. I'd still recommend using normal maps anyway if you can afford the extra textures, since it still looks better than nothing, but if you really need the light to glance off an edge, you'll need to actually bevel the mesh itself. This is one of the two exceptions of the pixels over polygons rule, and only do it sparingly. To compensate, try increasing the edge wear in your textures to kind of mask that a bit and still highlight the edges, just in a different way. Number seven, don't count on reflections. There are three main ways of getting reflections in a game engine. Screen space reflections, baked reflection probes, and real-time reflection probes. Screen space reflections are really hit or miss. They can be quite expensive since you're rendering two screens and they don't look very accurate, especially near the sides of your vision. It could be worth trying them out for super simple scenes as a subtle effect, but for most things it'll look pretty unnatural when you move your head, since they're not all that accurate. Baked reflection probes, on the other hand, are the best bet for VR, but they're still going to take precious resources, so only use them if you must. These will only reflect static objects, but are much cheaper to render than real-time probes. Real-time reflection probes look the best in theory, but they're extremely resource-intensive. If the only way to use them is to turn down the quality so low that it becomes really flickery and pixelated, it's probably best not to use it at all. Only use these if you absolutely need to see the player in a mirror or something similar and can't get that effect with anything else. A big aspect of great PBR shading is the roughness map. Those subtle variations in how blurry the reflections of a surface are can really help sell the material as realistic. But as you can imagine, blurring things takes resources, so roughness itself can be expensive to use. So when possible, try to use mobile-friendly materials that use the old-school diffuse and specular method and save the PBR roughness and reflections for objects that will really benefit from it. Number eight, cut it out with those cutouts. It's pretty common practice to use alpha mapped textures to make really low poly objects seem more detailed. And it's especially useful when it comes to grass and trees. But as with everything else in VR, there's a caveat to how it should be used. In Unity, opaque objects are drawn from front to back, but transparent objects are drawn from back to front. So when a transparent object is drawn on top of another object behind it, we have what's called an overdraw of one. 
meaning that those pixels will need to be drawn twice. An overdraw of six means that they will actually be drawn seven times, and since we're in VR, that problem is multiplied by two. So it's actually drawn 14 times, just for some grass cards. So we can get away with using some transparency in our materials, but if we overdo it, then we'll see some pretty significant performance decreases. Number nine, bake everything. Anything dynamic is going to take a lot more resources, so when making assets for VR, try to bake as much as possible. We already talked about using pre-baked reflection probes, but also try to bake your lighting with its shadows and global illumination. Batching isn't quite the same as baking, but the idea of keeping as many things non-dynamic as possible is similar, so I'll include it here as well. Be sure to set any non-moving objects as static. That way, they can all be combined together, or batched, and rendered faster as one large mesh. And finally, number 10, use LODs. Even when batching and instancing, polycount can still be an issue for scenes that have wide open spaces. A common way to minimize polycount for common objects that you'll see both up close and far away is to use levels of detail, aka LODs. Our friends at Phosphor Studios wrote a great guide on how to make nature LODs for VR, and it's a bit more complex than just reducing the number of polygons. Remember that pixels over polygons rule? Well, the second exception to that is when it comes to transparency, since overdraw is even more of a problem than a couple extra polygons. So the LOD closest to the camera has cutouts around most of the transparency, and the ones in the middle don't have any transparency at all. And then the ones farthest away can rely on transparency, since they're not likely to be drawn in front of opaque objects. They go over it in much more detail there, so I'd recommend checking out the article on their site to learn more. So to recap, build things to scale, think like a designer, use more pixels instead of more polygons except when it comes to transparency and sometimes beveling, share as many textures, materials, and other kinds of data between objects as possible, use fairly even textile density, be careful with normal maps and reflections, reduce your overdraw, bake as much as possible, and cleverly use levels of detail. With those in mind, you're now ready to start making assets for VR. If you're looking to brush up on your modeling skills in general, check out our huge library of courses, including my recent mesh modeling bootcamp. We also have courses on both VR and AR over on the game dev part of the site, so definitely check those out if that's something that you're interested in. So I hope that helps. Check out the description for links to learn more, and I'll see you around on cgcookie.com.